All right, so check this out. The following is a story that took place quite a few years ago, but it still baffles me, and I'd like to share it here. I'm a teenager, and I've been in the Boy Scouts almost my entire life. I really enjoy exploring with my friends and being trusted more now that I'm older. A few years ago, myself and two girls, Amy and Harriet, were asked to go into the woods surrounding our campsite to find a long, straight stick suitable for carving into a point. Remember, I was a lot younger then. Harriet was the oldest, and Amy was only one year older than myself. We walked in the same direction to avoid getting lost and memorized our surroundings as we went. After 15 minutes, we couldn't find the right kind of stick, so we turned back towards the campsite. That's when the initial panic set in. The trees appeared to have knitted themselves together in a way that completely concealed our path, like it had just vanished. We turned a complete circle, and everything looked exactly the same. Trees we could have sworn were different all looked like copies of one another. We continued walking in what we thought would be the right direction while shouting out for help, and eventually we came to a concrete path. It was almost like a road, but thinner, and it split the forest in half. We didn't follow the road because we knew it was going in the wrong direction. On the other side of the path was more forest, however. There was an abandoned shack nearby, probably used for storage at one point. We had no idea anything like this was out there, so we just kept walking. Eventually, we came to a road that we didn't recognize. A woman, wearing a pink and purple regatta outdoors coat, walked past and we frantically asked her for directions. By now, we'd been walking for an hour and a half. She said she had never seen it before, but she pointed in the direction of another campsite. We followed her advice and eventually came back to our campsite. We apologized for being gone for so long and still not finding anything. The leader, Ian, could see that the three of us were shaken up, but he said we were only gone for 25 minutes and we hadn't used all of our free time yet. To this day, it still baffles all three of us. The time limit was 40 minutes, and our watches said that we were gone for hours. The forest we were lost in just felt crushing and claustrophobic, like we had entered an area where the concept of time didn't apply. I believe in the paranormal, but this was so unlike anything I've heard or experienced before, it was like we entered a time vortex. Hours in the forest were only minutes in the rest of the world. The feeling was very strange and it stuck with me for the rest of our trip. Thank you for reading my story. It's a weird one, but it's true. This happened about 13 years ago when I was a sophomore at a liberal arts college in Suffolk County, New York. Within the first couple of months of freshman year, I found myself in a very tight-knit group of fellow theater geeks. In total, there were six guys and one girl. Plus, they all loved horror movies and ghost stories. I had found my crew. That year was tough, but we supported each other and made the whole experience more enjoyable. At the beginning of sophomore year, we decided to find a creepy wooded spot in a nearby town for the Halloween season. We wanted to scare the crap out of ourselves. We did some research and found a particularly isolated area known for paranormal sightings about 30 minutes away. It was perfect. The seven of us took two cars and headed out into the night. Allow me to set the scene. You turn off the busy main road flooded with strip malls and restaurants and you're almost immediately greeted by complete darkness. Again, this area was heavily wooded. It was essentially a large web of winding roads surrounded by trees with very few streetlights or houses. Without a GPS or good sense of direction, one can easily get lost. 
we made sure to have fully charged phones and flashlights just in case. But the goal was to keep driving until we collectively decided to pull over and go exploring. We turned left off of the main road and drove roughly 30 more minutes into this dark network, picking directions at random and intentionally getting lost. Eventually, we turned to find a huge log in front of us. We had reached a dead end with nothing but trees beyond it. We all got out, stepped over the log, and noticed two narrow trails leading in different directions. This seemed like a good a time as any to grab our flashlights and do some amateur ghost hunting. We flipped a coin and set off on the trail to the right. It was so narrow we had to walk single file to avoid being hit by branches. For some reason, I ended up in the back. I'm usually pretty rational and level-headed, but the further we went in, the more uneasy I became. I kept hearing sounds deep in the woods and couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. But I was the only one hearing things. I shrugged it off as my imagination. Our whole reason for being there was to get scared. Plus, we were seven able-bodied college students. What would we come across that could take us down? We headed down this trail for about 20 minutes, and just as I thought it would never end, we came to a massive clearing. It was a large, open field of unkempt grass, like a golf course, but much less manicured. Trees surrounded the entire field, and we couldn't see the end from where we stood. I was thrilled to get out of that narrow trail, but I don't think any of us were expecting to find an area so vast. One of us looked to the right and said, Hey, check that out. We all turned to see an old, dilapidated house several hundred yards away. It was completely dark, with no cars or signs of anyone living there. We walked over to shine our lights at it and found the windows and doors boarded up. I managed to peer between the boards on one window and saw an old, white couch covered in plastic but an otherwise empty room. Whoever used to live there was long gone. Since there was no way in, and we were sufficiently creeped out by the house anyway, we decided to sit down near the trail and discuss where to go next. As we walked back, but before we could sit, Mark stopped, his expression dropped, and we saw him point. We all turned, on the far side of the field, directly across from where we entered, we saw someone tall, lanky, and pale dancing among the trees. And by dancing, I mean he was skipping, grabbing trees and swinging around them, basically a do -si do The moon was so bright and the woods so dark, it took a second for us to really understand what we were looking at. Jay, the 6'4 skeptic of our group, wasn't seeing it. I leaned into him, pointed in that direction and said, Jay, look where I'm pointing. Don't you see that? He squinted, and the second he saw it, he gasped loudly, clutched my arm, and he whispered, What the frick is that? What happened next sent shock waves through us all. Whoever this was, they stopped dancing, looked in our direction, and started charging straight at us. Without thinking, we panicked and ran back to the trail. Yet again, Jay was the only one who didn't see what was happening. He shouted after us. He said, guys, what is it? Where are you going? After roughly 15 seconds of running like hell, I heard Jay scream some expletive. I looked back and saw his flashlight following the rest of us into the trail. While the walk into the woods took 20 minutes, we made it back to our cars and were peeling away in five. Once we were a safe distance, we pulled over, got out, and checked in with each other about what had just happened. My heart was pounding, and I know everyone else felt the same way. Nearly 15 years later, we're all still friends. We live in different states, but have kept in touch through marriages, divorces, and children. Occasionally, out of the blue, one of us will send a group text to the others with something to the effect of, 
the woods. That really happened, right? It most certainly did. That experience is always in the back of my mind, and I'm pretty sure it always will be. Here's the thing that still resonates with me about that night. Whoever was dancing maniacally in the woods at one in the morning ran directly for a group of young adults and wasn't phased by the fact that they were severely outnumbered. Did he know we were there from the second we parked? Was he the sound that I kept hearing as we walked the trail? Whatever the case, when he came for us that night, you can be sure none of us wanted to stick around and see what he was capable of. I'm a 25-year-old male who's into urbex, which is urban exploration. It's something I often do alone and typically start at dawn. This story reaffirmed that decision for me. One night, I was out drinking with some buddies and my hobby came up later in the night. The place we went to was starting to die down, so they asked if I knew of a cool spot nearby. The first place that popped into my mind was an old, abandoned factory in the woods. It was roughly a five to ten minute drive. I didn't quite remember the path to get there. You have to leave the trail at some point, and the cloud cover made it difficult to see. Plus, one of my friends isn't in the best shape thanks to diabetes. I had them stay on the trail while I fumbled around in the dark to make sure we were going in the right direction. When I finally returned, they asked how far out I went because they heard something walk by the trail. I dismissed it as a stray dog and led them into the woods until we saw the fence. Then we followed it until finding the hole someone made ages ago. When we were getting close, I heard footsteps roughly 15 feet to our right on the same side of the fence, and I stopped dead in my tracks. At that moment, my entire body was screaming for me to run, and the only thing going through my mind was, those were human. I turned back to my friends, and judging by the looks on their faces, they heard it too. I told them we should skip this for tonight, and they quickly agreed and turned back to the trail while I stayed behind to make sure they weren't followed. And yes, I know I would be the first to die in a horror movie. As I waited for them to get further away, I didn't hear or see anything. Once I thought they made it back to the trail, I took off running, and we quickly made it back to the car. Since then, I've chalked it up to a homeless guy going there to crash for the night, but it felt like they were following us, and it triggered my fight-or-flight instinct super hard. This story really isn't that scary, but it's a little unsettling. I grew up two hours north of New York City in a small town off a state highway. I lived in a small house on a big plot and the forest behind it went on for miles and miles. There was a trail that I could access from our land, but I had never done so. My grandma would stay with us quite often. And around the same time every year, some sort of fungus would start growing around our land. I don't know if they were mushrooms, but they kind of look like large reptilian eggs. Grandma would say to stay away from them because the witch put them there. She also said to stay away from the trail because the witch lived there. I was about five or six at the time, and I remember not believing her, but I did heed her advice and I stayed away from both. One day, my sister and I were playing outside while Grandma watched us. The eggs were grown, and we glanced at the trail's entrance, and we froze. Standing there was a white woman dressed in a black robe and a black hat. Without hesitation, my sister and I bolted inside, and Grandma followed us. My sister doesn't remember this now, and grandma's too old, but I have vivid memories from that age. It's possible this memory is something that I just created in my head, but I know what my memories from preschool feel like. This happened a few years later, and it sure does feel like a memory. 
I have always believed that there are things in the woods that we don't understand and have reason to fear. I'm definitely a believer in skinwalkers, and I would be very interested to have someone to help me figure out what was growing in my yard. This is the first of many creepy stories that my roommate and I experienced during our freshman year of college. For context, Pat and I met in high school and roomed together in college. They say don't live with your friends, but we had a lot in common and got along very well. We were city kids, but we went to college out in the sticks. The campus was secluded from the highway and surrounded by woods. Our freshman year, we shared a typical cinder block dorm room. Two single beds, two desks, two dressers, and a closet with no doors. There was space at the top for storage containers with enough room for someone to sit up there if they wanted, and often we did. One night, we stayed up late, just BSing for hours. We talked about school, dream jobs, girls, religion, all the basics, when Pat suddenly changed his tone. He said he was having recurring dreams that were freaking him out. In the dream, he was walking in the woods and came across a very unnerving porcelain doll. Every time he tries to pick it up, he suddenly wakes in a panic, like one does when they dream that they're falling. I could see it was bothering him, but wasn't too concerned. I told him he probably was worrying too much and it would likely pass in time. That was my opinion until I started having the same dream just a few days later. One night, we had the dream at the same time and we both woke up screaming. This happened on Thursday night, and since the next day was Friday and we both had light schedules, we decided to take our bikes on a ride through the woods. After class, we got lunch at the cafeteria, hopped on our bikes, and took the trail into the woods. Since Pat is the most familiar with the dream, he led the way and remarked how similar the woods were to his dreams. We rode for an hour and we could both feel the tension and bad vibes increasing as we went deeper into the forest. Pat stopped suddenly and said, this is it. This is where the doll is. Let's go right. We went a quarter of a mile into the brush and we found it. It was a porcelain baby doll with a green dress and bonnet. It was an exact match to the one from our dream. We felt the bad vibes intensify to the point where we were dripping in sweat even though it was a cool, overcast autumn day. The most unnerving thing was that this doll was in pristine condition, completely unaffected by the elements. The wind blew hard enough to cause our shirts to flare out and our bikes to rattle, but the doll didn't move an inch. We quickly looked at each other and without saying a word, we agreed it was time to leave. We hopped on our bikes and took off for campus. Neither of us could sleep that night, so we put on a movie and took some Z-Quil. Eventually, we passed out. In the early morning hours, we woke to the sound of a girl giggling. We both thought the other may have snuck a girl in, but that wasn't the case. A voice said, Hey, up there and we looked to see the storage cut out above the closet. A red-headed girl with a white dress and an indistinguishable face sat there, expressionless, and we only stared. In a passive voice, she said, why did you leave me there? Neither of us could speak. I finally managed to mumble in unsure, what? You heard me. I said, why did you leave me there? Suddenly, everything on the storage cutout fell to the floor and broke open. The noise was so loud that it woke our neighbors, who thankfully were also good friends. They knocked on the door from the adjoining bathroom and came in. We had no way of explaining what happened, and they would think we were crazy. Instead, we told them the base of the cutout broke and just dumped our stuff all over the floor. They accepted the story, and we spent the remainder of the night cleaning the mess left by that redhead. We never went back to those woods, and we never went looking for the doll. 
The dream kept happening, but thankfully slowly fizzled away. To this day, Pat and I are still close friends, but we don't talk about the doll or the girl. This is a true story that happened a little while ago. I get sick quite often since my immune system sucks and I have a horrible acid reflux, so I stay home a lot while my mom and stepdad work. I got picked up from school early a few weeks ago because I wasn't feeling well and mom said to take our dog for a walk. No big deal. I'll sit and rest while he plays. It's something that I do regularly. As I'm sitting there, my dog starts acting weird. He's a chihuahua puppy, and if you have one, you know that they're weird little dudes. At first, I didn't think anything of it, but he usually barks, and this time, he was just shying towards me and whimpering. It was strange, but again, he's weird, so my dumb self didn't think anything of it. Then, I start hearing weird sounds coming from the woods... For context, my house is surrounded by thick, deep woods and the highway is out front. Other than that, I'm pretty secluded. I step off my porch and that's when I really hear what's making him so nervous. It sounds like a puppy or a fox is hurt really badly, so I, an idiot, start walking towards it to look for the animal to make sure it's okay. As I'm getting closer, my dog is losing his mind and barking at me to go back. That's when it started to sound less like an animal and more like someone trying to sound like an animal. It sounded like someone with a scratchy throat trying to make a whimpering puppy noise. It was freaky as hell. Maybe my dog is onto something. I scoop him up and we go back inside for the rest of the day. The next incident was about a week later, when I was home alone, sick again. I was calling my dog to come eat his breakfast and yell, Here, Brian. But then I heard my mother's voice say, Come here, Brian. Come here, boy. From the woods. Holy forking shirt balls. I called my mom, and she insisted that she was still at work. I called my very logical dad in tears, and he said it was either an echo or just my imagination, but I know what I heard. There's no way she could have pranked me either. I called her work, and they confirmed that she had been there the whole time. I'm an extremely spiritual witch and believe in all kinds of spirits. I even work with two deities and practice witchcraft often. At this point, I'm open to whatever explanation there is, but I know this was paranormal. I'm like a magnet for that kind of stuff. If you have any idea what that could have been, please let me know. I've told this story probably over a hundred times and despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate that makes for a great story, so I'll figure I'll share it with you here. I should start by saying that I always hated camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, however, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but we were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights, we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip was a time where the counselors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I didn't know, however, was that the events of that camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods again. The trip began as any other. Altogether, there were around 30 people on the trip, four counselors in training, four counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 14. Walking in a single file line up and down the various trails, 
you could hardly hear any sounds of nature over the conversations and laughter of the campers. As several hours went by and we made our way through a dense, marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training, Jordan, as well as two campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers, until the last of them faded out of view around a bend about 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire and the other half appeared to have been killed by some disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated by a small derelict cabin sitting in the middle of the scorched forest, but seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through the area. We were so enraptured by the scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned to look at where the sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us was a haggard-looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a long black beard, slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked on us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him, and we had no idea how long he had been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's speed up and get back with the rest of the group. As we turned to continue our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around and asked the man to repeat himself. The man muttered again, slightly louder, Going camping? Jordan answered the man, Yes, we are going camping. To which the man smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Better be careful. We nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on to try to find the rest of the group, this time with a much faster pace. Although the man had been walking up the same trail as us when we saw him, he didn't continue, but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail watching us as we made our way up the winding path and disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up to the rest of the group who had been waiting for us, and we told the adult counselors about our interaction with that man. They just shrugged it off, telling us that the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we were doing near his property. Still, I felt unnerved by the encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man had somehow followed us. Eventually, though, I put it out of my mind and managed to enjoy myself a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed, and Jordan and the other counselor in training from the boys' cabin had brought two warm Mike's harders that they had stolen from the counselor's quarters. Then I took out a joint that I had stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint, and we made our way to the edge of the river where we had washed our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and the thought of the man from earlier kept popping into my head. Assuming that I was cold, not anxious, Jordan gave me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night so I could sleep in the same tent with him, and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this, and after smoking the joint, we made our way back to our tents, which were pitched slightly away from the others, and we discreetly sipped on the mic's harders while telling scary camping stories. Some time passed, and one of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly just making up on the spot, when he suddenly stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away. 
near one of the other camper's tents. As we strained to listen to what was going on, the noises stopped and even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom, being stoned and hopped up from the scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide in our tents. Jordan followed suit and we awkwardly made out before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sound of footsteps walking around near my tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quiet my breathing. From the sound, it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of my tent, seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan, but I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one that I had been hearing, I closed my eyes when I was just beginning to drift back to sleep when I heard the tent being unzipped. I felt Jordan lie down next to me and after a few moments, he put his arms around me and began to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realized I had to go to the bathroom and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie over his head before going still again. Quietly, so as not to wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement. Comforting myself that Jordan had just gone pee and was fine, I put my shoes on and began making the trek across our campsite to the designated pee zone. I just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite, as if someone was rummaging through our supplies in our bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull up my pants and, in my haste, I lost my balance and I tried to catch myself with a branch that made a loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes and the light was getting bigger, so whoever it was, they were coming toward me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got about 10 feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, Sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers might have stolen it from my bag while I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out, but you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. What he said next made my blood run cold. What are you talking about? He said. It's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if I had left it by accident, but after I couldn't find it, I thought I'd check the boys' bags and that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror as I realized that the man who got into the tent with me just moments prior wasn't Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened and I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was sleeping in our tent right now. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent and when Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow lying still inside our tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur, but we ran to the pod of tents on the other side of the campground where the older counselors were sleeping and frantically unzipped their tents and started yelling for them to come out and that there was a man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselors slowly and groggily woke up, but after a bit more frantic yelling, they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation when a commotion broke out on the other side of camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, 
We heard the counselors radioing back down to the camp to call the police, and we could tell that they were as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept at all after that. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to... I made noise. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up, and by that time, a few of the other counselors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, one of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want the hoodie back and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy that we ran into earlier on the trail, but his face in that night still haunt me. I'm a 25-year-old male, and I'm into urbex, or urban exploration. It's something I often do alone and during the day, typically early dawn, and this story reaffirmed that decision for me. So, one night, I was out drinking with some buddies and my hobby came up later in the night. The place we were at was starting to die down, so they asked me if there was anywhere cool nearby that we could go. The first place that popped into my head was an old abandoned factory that was in the woods, probably a 5 or 10 minute drive away, so we went. Now, I didn't quite remember the path to get there. You have to leave the trail at some point, and there was a cloud cover, so visibility was super low, and one of them is pretty unathletic thanks to diabetes. So, I had them stay on the trail as I fumbled around in the dark to make sure that we were going in the right direction. When I finally got back, they asked how far out I went because they heard something walk by parallel to the trail. I shook it off and dismissed it as a stray dog or something and I led them into the woods until we hit the fence. I then started leading them along the fence to the hole that someone cut out forever ago. And when we're getting close, I hear footsteps that weren't ours, maybe 15 feet to the right of us, which is the same side as the fence and I stopped dead in my tracks. In that moment, my entire body was screaming at me to run, and the only thing that went through my head in the moment was, those were human footsteps. I turned back to my friends, and judging by the looks on their faces, they had heard it too. I told my friends that we should skip this for the night and head back. They quickly agreed and started back to the trail as I stayed behind to make sure whoever was there didn't follow them, which I know is usually the first dead person in a horror movie. As I waited for them to get further away, I didn't hear or see anything move, and once I assumed that they were back at the trail, I took off running after them and we quickly made it back to the car. Since then, I've chalked it up to some homeless dude going to the same place to crash for the night, but it felt like they were following us, and for whatever reason, that triggered my fight, or fight super hard, response. So, this is a true story that happened to me just a little bit ago. I get sick quite often as my immune system is jank and I have a horrible acid reflux, so I stay home alone a lot while my mom and stepdad go to work. I got picked up early from school a few weeks ago because I wasn't feeling good, and my mom told me to make sure to walk our dog outside for a bit. Okay, no big deal. I'll sit and rest while he plays, a normal thing that I do. But as I'm sitting there, my dog starts to act weird. He's a chihuahua puppy, and if you have one or have been around one, you know they are weird little dudes, so I didn't think anything of it. But when he acts weird, he barks, and this time he was just shying towards me and whimpering. Strange, but again, he's weird, so I didn't think anything of it. But then I start hearing these weird sounds in my woods. Now, for some context, my house is surrounded by thick woods, and in the front is a highway. Other than that, I'm pretty secluded, and there's woods everywhere, and they're pretty deep. So I step off of my porch and that's when I really hear what's making him so nervous. It sounds like an animal is hurt, 
like a really hurt puppy or fox or something like that. So I, being an idiot, start walking towards the woods to see if I can see the animal and make sure it's okay. As I'm getting closer, my dog is losing his shit and trying to bark at me to go back. That's when it started to sound less like an animal and more like someone trying to sound like an animal. It sounded like someone with a scratchy throat trying to make a whimpering puppy or dog sound. Maybe my dog is onto something. So I scoop him up and we go back inside for the rest of the day. The next incident was about a week after that. I was calling my dog to come eat his breakfast, which again, I was home alone sick, and I yell, here Brian, that's my dog's name, and then I hear in my mother's voice, come here Brian, here boy, coming from my woods. I call my mom and she insists that she's at work and hadn't been home since she left. I call my dad in tears and he's a very logical guy and says it was either my voice echoing or my imagination, but you know, I know what I heard. There's no way that she could have pranked me either because I called her work and they confirmed that she was there and she had been there the whole time. I'm an extremely spiritual witch and I believe in all kinds of spirits. I even work with two deities and practice witchcraft often if that has anything to do with the incident or maybe if that would explain it. At this point, I'm open to whatever explanation there is, but I know this was paranormal. I'm like a magnet for that stuff. If you have any idea what that could have been, please let me know. So I go to this summer camp every year for two weeks. It's a really awesome place and I still love it. And this experience didn't make it any worse. It was the second night and I woke up at around two or four, I mean, guessing on the moon, I didn't have a clock, and I saw a pale, bright, translucent figure walking through the tent entrance and then walk to the end of the tent. I closed my eyes and hid because I was scared shitless at the time. I decided to take another peek just to make sure I wasn't seeing things and it was still there, staring out the tent window, which was really just an open flap, and then he turned and then he left. In the morning, I told everyone what I saw and of course, nobody believed me, which is understandable, ghosts aren't like a common thing, you know? But in the afternoon, I was alone with one other kid that we'll call Henry and we set up a mag light that we bought from the camp store that was as simple as asking, is there anyone that would like to talk to us? And the light flashed on. Henry left the room, and I continued to ask questions with pretty solid light responses. And that's my one and only ghost story. I grew up in New York, about two hours north of New York City. It was a small town off of a state highway. I lived in a small house on a pretty big plot, and behind it was a forest that went on for miles and miles. There was an opening to a trail that I could access from the land that my house was on, but I had never done so. My grandma used to stay with us quite often. Around the same time every year, some sort of fungus or something similar would grow on our land. I don't know if it was mushrooms, but they looked like eggs. Kind of like large reptile eggs. My grandma would tell us to stay away from these eggs because the witch put them there. She also told us to stay away from the trail because, well, the witch lived there. I must have been about five or six at the time and I remember not believing in the witch, but I did heed my grandma's advice and I stayed away from both. One day, my sister and I were playing outside while my grandma was watching us. The eggs had grown in by this time. We were running around when my sister and I glanced at the entrance of the trail and then we froze. Standing there, was a white woman dressed in a black robe of some kind and a black hat. 
Without hesitation, my sister and I bolted inside. My grandma followed us. My sister doesn't remember this much now and my grandma is too old to. However, I have an eidetic memory and have vivid memories from the ages of three to four. It's possible that this memory is something I created in my head somehow and I know that does occur. However, I know what my memories from preschool feel like and this happened a few years after and it sure does feel like a memory. Let me know what you think. I've always believed that there are some things in the woods that we don't understand and have reason to fear. I'm definitely a believer in skinwalkers. I'd be very interested in someone helping me figure out what is growing in my yard. It was like 11 p.m. when my friends and I decided to be brave and to go to the woods at nighttime. A really crazy thing to do, but yeah. So we took our bicycles and we went there. Of course, we brought some lanterns with us. We had our phones with us too. Everything was good, right? Well, after five minutes of walking there, we started to hear footsteps. We started to panic a little bit, thinking, who was in the woods with us? We continued walking, with our bicycles close to us, in case we needed to run fast, because anything can happen in the woods at night, <laughs> right? After like two minutes, we started to hear someone cutting down a tree. How funny. We were there alone, at nighttime, with someone we probably didn't know who had an axe. Yes, we were really lucky, right? <laughs> The moment we started realizing that it wasn't a good idea to go there at night was when we saw blood. Yeah, it could be the blood of an animal or something, but why risk it? Then we started to hear someone laughing really loud. That was it. We were up on our bikes and we were gone. I remember we cycled so fast that the next day we all had pain in our legs. The experience was really cool, like the adrenaline that we were feeling, but I don't know if we would ever do that again. So this is the first of many creepy stories that my roommate and I experienced our freshman year of college. For context, me and my best friend, Pat, met in high school and roomed together in college. They say don't live with your friends, but we had a lot in common and got along super well. There were no issues there. We were city kids, but we went to college out in the sticks. The campus was secluded from the highway and was surrounded by woods. Our freshman year, we shared a typical cinder block dorm room, two single beds, two desks, two dressers, and a closet with no doors which had a cutout on the top of it for storage containers. There was enough space for someone to climb up and sit up there if they wanted to, and we often did. One night, as usual, we stayed up late just BSing for hours. We talked school, dream jobs, girls that we liked, what we thought about God, things like that. Pat suddenly changed his tone. He told me that he was having these recurring dreams that were freaking him out. In the dream, he was walking in the woods and came across a porcelain doll that, for whatever reason, was very unnerving to him. Every time he went to pick it up, he would suddenly wake up in a panic, like you do when you dream that you're falling. I could see that it was bothering him, but I didn't think anything of it. I told him that he was probably thinking too much into it and it would likely pass in time. This was my opinion on the matter until a few days later. I started having the same dream. One night, we had the dream at the same time and we both woke up screaming. This happened on Thursday night and we decided that since the next day was Friday and we both had a light schedule, we would take our bikes on a ride in the woods near our campus. So Friday comes and we do just that. Class ends. We get lunch at the cafeteria and then we hop on our bikes and ride the trail that leads into the woods. 
Since Pad is the most familiar with the dream, he leads the way, remarking the whole time how similar the dream is to the woods that we were currently riding in. We rode for an hour, and we could both feel the tension and the uncomfortable vibes increasing the deeper we went on the trail. Pat stopped suddenly and said, This is it. This is where the doll is. Let's go right. We went maybe a quarter mile into the brush, and we found it. It was a porcelain baby doll with a green dress and bonnet. It was an exact match to the dream that we had both been having. We felt the bad vibes intensify to the point where we were dripping in sweat, even though it was a cool and overcast autumn day. The most unnerving thing was that the doll was in pristine condition, completely unaffected by the dirt and the mud around it. The wind blew hard enough to cause our shirts to flare out and our bikes to rattle, but the doll didn't move an inch. Quickly, we looked at each other and without a word spoken, we agreed that it was time to leave. We hopped on our bikes and we took off for the campus. Neither of us could sleep that night, so we put on a movie and took some Z-Quil. Eventually, we passed out. In the early morning hours, we both woke up and we heard a girl giggling. We both had thought maybe the other snuck a girl in, but that wasn't the case. We heard a voice say, Hey, up here. And we looked up at the storage cut out above the closet. A red-headed girl in a white dress and an indistinguishable face sat there expressionless. And we just stared. In a passive voice, she said, Why did you leave me there? Neither of us could speak. I managed to mumble out an unsure and quiet, What? You heard me. I said, Why did you leave me there? In a flash, everything on the storage cut out fell to the floor and broke open. The noise was so unnaturally loud, so loud that it woke our neighbors up next door, who thankfully were also good friends. They knocked on the door from the adjoining bathroom and entered the room. We had no way of explaining to them what happened. We thought that they'd think we were crazy, so we told them we think the base of the cutout just broke and dumped our stuff on the floor. They accepted the story, and we spent the remainder of the night cleaning the mess that the redhead girl left. We never went back into those woods. We never went looking for the doll. The dream kept occurring, but slowly fizzled away. To this day, as close of friends as we are, we don't talk about the doll in the woods or the redhead girl. I've only had one bad experience with the deep web, and it was way more than enough in my personal opinion. I'm not an overly technical person, I'm not a tech genius, I'm no hacker extraordinaire, but I do know my way around the internet, and I have an understanding of what indexing and non-indexed pages, like the deep web, actually are. I took a few classes on internet security and there were a couple of sections dedicated to deep web and dark web, or at least explaining what they were, how the technology worked, like onion routing and encryption, and I felt confident enough to get on the deep web and I thought I could keep myself safe. And that confidence was my first mistake, but in my defense, this situation could have happened on the surface web. It just made it that much creepier that it was on the deep web. Because I wasn't interested in any of the illegal content on the dark web, I kept myself confined to the part of the deep web that was closer to the surface. Basically, the waiting pool of the deep web. Of these pages, I mostly visited things like forums and discussion boards. I had this personal appreciation for anonymous conversations. And while I wasn't a troll or aggressive or anything, I was a bit more out with my opinion and my personality as there wasn't a name associated with the statement. Now, in order for all of this to make sense, I have to explain a bit about what happened. 
and then kind of explain the how because it won't make much sense otherwise. As stated, I spent a good amount of time on the forums. I spoke with people that I honestly considered to be friends, and I learned a lot. It was actually kind of nice, kind of like a place where I felt like I belonged, like a bar but with text and random people that were faceless. Now, on the main forum I would use, most people signed their posts and messages with a pseudonym. Of course, there was no control over this and anyone could use anyone else's name on their post and no one would be the wiser. Strangely enough, it was kind of an honor system and most people followed it. My name on this site was, ironically, No Girls on the Net. It was supposed to be a joke, a play on the claim that there are no girls on the internet, just guys pretending to be girls. This was ironic because I was a girl. Anyway, on this forum, I was fairly well known to a lot of the people in my subboards, and people would refer to me as girl. I know, not exactly specific, but typically when someone said girl, they were talking to me. Anyways, I was friends with a lot of people on this page, and they were all decent, never ran into anyone that I thought was really creepy, for the most part. And that all fell apart when I got a message on Facebook one day from some guy that I'd never seen before named Derek. And the message just said, Hey girl. At first, I didn't put two and two together. I thought he was just being a douche and I told him as such. My response was simply, What an incredibly rude and derogatory way to refer to someone. Give me one reason why I should even bother responding to you beyond this. The guy responds with, I thought that's what everyone called you. At least that's what I've always called you. You're no girls on the net, right? When I read this, I was a bit freaked out. How had this person found my personal Facebook? There was absolutely no connection between me and that account, and I was always careful to not post anything that could be considered personally identifiable, and I had no idea how he could have connected the dots. I asked who he was, and he once again asked if that was my username. I didn't want to tell him yes, but... I also didn't want to say anything that may indirectly confirm that it was me, so I ended up just having to say that it wasn't me, and then I hoped he found whoever it was that he thought he was looking for. He responded with a smiley face, and then that was it for that conversation. I thought that was the end of it. I thought he had bought it, but I was wrong. I was very wrong. About a week later, I got a letter in the mail, and while this was a bit off, in today's day and age that is, I didn't think too much of it. I took it in, and opened it, and then I pulled out the letter. It was a printed letter that pretty much just said, Don't lie to me, girl. I know it's you. I want to get to know you better. Here's my phone number. Shoot me a text when you get this. P.S. I will know that you got it. I was seriously freaked out. This guy was sending me letters, which meant that he knew my address. Not only that, but he claimed that he would somehow know if I got the letter and didn't tell him. But how? That's when I looked over at the envelope to see if I can find a return address, and then I realized that there wasn't one. On top of that, there weren't any stamps on the envelope either, which meant that it hadn't gone through the post office, and it was most likely and delivered, which then told me how he was going to know if I got it. My next mistake was calling the number. If I was going to fix this problem, I was going to have to do it head on. I pulled out my phone and I called him. When he answered, he started off with, hey sweetheart. I was legitimately disgusted. My response to him was, I'm not your sweetheart. I don't even know who the hell you are how did you find my information? He avoided the question, but started saying that he was in love with me, and that he needed me in his life. I once again told him that I had no idea who he was, and that I wasn't interested. He told me to get 
interested, or things were going to be difficult between us. Now, I had had enough. I told him that he was a creep and that he needed to get a life, and then I hung up. He tried calling me back a couple of times, but I ignored it. Then he texted me, and I think I nearly pissed myself. The message that he sent me said, You're going to love me, one way or another. Don't make me hurt you. Then he followed it up with, See you later, sweetheart. Obviously, I was panicked. This dude was a super creep and had no issue with being creepy out in the open like this. But I really didn't have much in ways of options since he hadn't actually done anything. Being a creep isn't really a crime until they escalate. And well, it escalated pretty quickly. It was actually that same night when things happened. Around 8 that evening, I heard a knock on my door. I unfortunately knew it was most likely him. I pulled the curtain open from the side window and I saw this guy standing there in a hooded sweatshirt and black pants. Pretty obvious red flags in this case. He stood there at the door and kept knocking, and then started yelling that he knew I was home. I stayed off to the side where he couldn't see me, and I dialed 911 on my cell phone. When they asked what the emergency was, I said loud enough for him to hear me that there was some creep trying to break into my house, hoping that it would be enough to get him to go away. What I didn't expect was him to smash the glass of my front door with a hammer and reach in to unlock the door. What he didn't expect was my brother, a trained police officer, to come around the corner with his gun locked on him the second he stepped in the house. As soon as my brother screamed, get on the ground, this guy started yelling, don't shoot me, and fell to his knees. My brother restrained him, and the cops showed up to arrest him. When they got him out and in their car, they came back to tell us what they had pulled off of him. This dude came with zip-tie cuffs, a large knife, a hammer, obviously, and a pillowcase stuffed into the hoodie pocket. Basically, it was likely that he planned to kidnap me, cuff me, put the pillowcase over my head, and take me out to his van, which he had parked just outside. In the van, they found condoms, adult toys, and various other creeper things that I don't really want to think about right now. So, that's the what. But the question becomes the how. How did he find me? How did he know who I was? How did he connect my stupid username with me as a person? Easy. I was an idiot, and apparently I had clicked a link that he had posted on the forum. This guy had linked to something on the forum page that I was apparently interested in and it had some malware that loaded into my system because I had some stupid software, something like JavaScript or Flash or something that was out of date and this guy was able to drop a keylogger on my system. And I had, unbeknownst to me, given him all of my personal information. Then he turned into a super creep. Like I said above, this could have technically happened on the surface web, but I think it was more likely to happen on the deep web forum because I had taken my anonymity for granted. I thought I was safe. I thought I was invincible because my name wasn't connected to the board or to the posts. So take that as a lesson. Do not think that anonymity is invincibility and make sure you update your computer. About two years ago, I was going shopping for a Valentine's gift for my girlfriend since I thought it would be a nice gesture. The walk to the store from where I live is about a 5-10 to ten minute walk. It was around 8pm so I just wanted to get home. I was walking in the road because there is next to no cars going down the road and I didn't feel like going through the park. I was approaching the park when I realized... I was being followed. I thought nothing of it at first, so I just got to walking. He then got closer and closer, and when I was walking past, I hear a, Hey, kid. I was shocked, but I wanted to ignore him, so 
and just kept walking. Then he said it again, but a bit more violently. So I turned around and this guy was in pissing distance from me. I'm 6'1", and this man was a bit taller than me. He then tried to set up a conversation like, How's your night? I felt a bit relieved and kind of thought poorly of myself for judging him so soon. I was right to assume it though. He then tries to keep a conversation going and then proceeds to ask, Where are you going? I just said, The store. He then walked up to a car. He then said, I can give you a ride. I said, No thank you, I can walk from here. He kept asking that same question and when he said, what about car surfing? He then tried to show me what it was. I still declined, and this guy was really creeping me out. I was still walking down the road while this was happening, and he still followed me, and thankfully I was reaching the store, and then he left me alone. For now. I then got the candy heart chocolate box and a teddy bear, and I was walking back home when I saw the guy again. The weird part was, he was following me from the other side. I feel like he waited for me, just to come walking by again. This was starting to scare me a bit. He then yelled, Hey! I was getting pretty scared at the moment. I then turned around, and this guy was like 6'5", and weighed a lot more than me. Being hesitant, I turned around. Now, this guy was starting to jog his way over to me, and then I noticed something off. The car was gone, meaning this guy either walked here or he wasn't alone. I acted oblivious like I didn't know the car was gone. He tried starting another conversation. I was really uncomfortable the first time, so I just said, I, hey, I really need to get back. And I started walking a bit faster on the fastest way home, which is through an alley. When I was going through, he was gone, and I was thankful. But when I was walking down the alley, I don't know what it was, but I saw the same car he was claiming as his own. When I went home, I wanted to know more about this guy. I looked online for something about him, and there was nothing. I wanted to know about the car. I didn't believe for a second that it was his, so I looked it up, and it was reported as stolen. I didn't think much of it, but I reported it just in case. I wasn't sure if they found it, or if they ever found the guy at all. I hope to never have to deal with him again. So, this is all kind of new for me, but I'm just going to put it out there. At the end of September, my Nana, who I was extremely close with and loved very, very much, passed on. Fast forward to December, I had moved into my first apartment, and we had talked many times about me moving, and she was excited for me to get it. Anyways, nothing unexplained or weird happened until last night. I came home from the gym around 3 p.m. I was having a rough day, and I was on the phone with my mom. I had gone into my bedroom in and out several times. My bed was made and nothing was on it. Around 5 p.m. or so, I started to wind down and got my shower. I come back into my room and sit on the edge of my bed, moisturizing, etc. I put on my pajamas and walk to the bathroom, maybe 3 or 5 minutes max. Mind you, I had no music on or anything and it was silent. I come back into my bedroom and the work clothes that I changed out of hours ago were sitting on my bed. I know for a fact that I put them in the hamper in the closet next to my bed. I was shocked because I knew they weren't there before because I was just sitting in that exact spot. Plus, I had already put my gym clothes in the hamper after my shower, so if I did leave my work clothes out, I would have put them in the hamper as well. It was just such a weird feeling knowing that it wasn't me. And I live alone, by the way. I checked everywhere for an imaginary intruder. I was just stunned. I said hello and if it was my Nana that I love her, but if not, that I'm friendly and I don't mean any harm. 
Nothing weird for the rest of the night, and I slept fine. No bumps in the night. But it was definitely a weird and unsettling feeling. I've told this to my friend at least a dozen times because he wants to make sense of it, and ultimately, he urged me to post it here so maybe someone can help me make sense of it. This truly shook me. I'm sorry for the long post, but he told me to give all the details that I had told him and the rules of the subreddit do as well. This happened on a road trip when I was 17, almost 18. It was me and my sister, a couple years older than me, and she was driving a super long, beaten road through the desert. About two hours on the road pass, and suddenly I noticed that the car that was behind us veered off on the road and came to a standstill. My sister audibly wonders what they're up to. A few dozen seconds later, there's this terrible series of bumps and cracks in the road that shake the car and knock the phone off of the seat, taking the aux cord out and halting the music. It lands close to me, so I pick it up and I start to reconnect the phone. When I do, we get this random, catchy ad about trash. The next thing of note happens just seconds after the ad ends. I stare off into the window and I see a truck parked ahead of us. As we pass it, I stupidly kept looking at it and the sheen it gave off, the glare from the sun, completely blinded me for a bit. When I closed my eyes, I still saw the outline of it. I was afraid that it was burned into my retinas when I finally opened my eyelids. It started to fade slowly, and all I can remember seeing after that is the emergency airbag in the car pop into my face and sounds of metal on metal. My vision started going black, and the image that's in my eyes from the truck fades completely. But when it fades, I open my eyes to see us still driving like nothing happened. That's when I noticed the car behind us. Same license plate as before, same car, same color, even the same driver as far as I could tell. The same things happened again. The road being bad and bumping the phone down, the aux disconnecting, and the same damn ad playing. All the while, I'm panicking in my head since my sister dismissed my questions like nothing out of the ordinary just happened. We come up to the truck again, and I stare. My eyes again have the after image of it. Just as before, I hear metal scraping and I feel the airbag pummel my face. As it fades, I'm scared to open my eyes again, but I hear my sister ask, what is that car doing? It forces my eyes open to see the same car for the third time, staring into the open desert before halting. I am in full-blown panic mode as I look ahead and see the crude road up ahead. I hold onto the phone for dear life and I manage to stop the phone from disconnecting, but we still get an ad when the next song plays. It's the same damn ad. As it nears its end, I stop myself from looking at the truck and instead I look ahead, noticing that the car in the opposite lane is swerving slightly. I piece it together in my head and caution my sister of the driver in the car. She has to swerve to avoid the car as it goes into the wrong side of the road, barely missing our car thanks to my sister's driving. The rest of the trip went without much of a hitch. My friend said that it may have been something like a quantum immortality or a swap between universes. I've always been interested in this stuff, but I have no clue how to explain my experience. Once more, I'm sorry for the long post. Here's the TLDR. Some sort of loop ends in a crash when I'm blinded. That happens twice, and the third time, I get to avoid a head-on collision. So, this story is from two or maybe three years ago. One night, on my way home from work, and to get home, I take some back roads as shortcuts, but on this particular night it was snowing, 
and the roads were a little icy, so I was driving slower than I normally do. On this route, I normally take day in and day out, has a long stretch of road that has hills that can be rough sometimes, and has no house or hunting camps on it or any other turnoffs at all. It's about three or four miles till the next intersection. I was about a quarter mile down this road when I see in my rearview mirror another car or truck coming up behind me as I was going up the first hill on this stretch of road. I was about halfway up this hill when they passed me. I crested the hill and I was expecting to see them going down the hill or on the short highway to the next hill, but I didn't see any taillights, so I slowed down, thinking that they went off the road and crashed. As I was coming down the hill, I was looking for the car or truck that had passed me, but I couldn't see much of anything, so I stopped at the bottom of the hill and put my four ways on. I got out of my truck with my flashlight, and I started to walk up the hill scanning the side of the road to see if I could find anything. I ended up reaching the top of the hill without finding any trace of the vehicle that had passed me, so I thought to myself, maybe they went off the road on the other side of the road, but I still didn't find anything. No tracks, no skid marks, no evidence of a vehicle going off the road or even driving on it at all except for my tracks knowing that on this road there have been a lot of accidents. So, in conclusion of this story, I strongly believe that I saw a ghost car that is stuck in a loop on the night that it crashed. When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas. It was the kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, so, well, yeah. But I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment, occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So that's why, on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents went out. Just better to avoid trouble. You know, We borrowed her dad's car, the little Honda hatchback, and we went into town. We stopped at the video store for a movie and went to the Dairy Queen for some ice cream, and then we headed home. Now, she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods along a lonely road with no streetlights. We're chatting, eating our blizzards when all of a sudden a car comes up behind us. It's no big deal. What was a very big deal was that when the headlights flooded the interior of our car, I saw two hands on the back seat and a head coming from the hatchback part of the car. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife. It was the only thing I had. She saw me and asked what was wrong Loudly, I said, Nothing. I just have to stop at my friend's house real quick. She knew that was bullshit. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and I jumped out of the car, yelling at her to jump out too. She jumped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. He popped up like a jack-in-the-box with empty hands waving, hey, 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 uh, uh, what are y'all up to tonight? It was some weird kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before, ever. I said, what in the holy frick are you doing in our car? His reply was, I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride. We sat there, staring at him with our mouths open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool, and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere in some random person's driveway, so whatever he was planning was forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off, the whole time he's telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, 
No. We dropped his ass off and noped out of there as soon as we could. As soon as he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking. and She was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him crawling out of the hatchback. I really hated that high school. So, this happened when I was a kid and my family and I lived in North Carolina. Our house was surrounded by woods and there was only a few neighbors around us. Every once in a while, during the night, at around midnight, I would lay in bed because I couldn't sleep. I felt a creepy vibe like something or someone was watching me. Sometimes I would hear footsteps coming from the attic above my bedroom. It sounded like someone was walking around. I went outside my bedroom into the hallway and everyone in my family was sleeping and their doors were closed so I went back to my bedroom and closed my door. I was laying in my bed again and I heard the footsteps in the attic. Then I heard something fall in my closet. I was so scared that I ran into my parents' bedroom and woke them up. They were confused at first, but then I explained to them what I had heard. My mom and dad said it was probably just my imagination and they didn't believe me. They walked with me back to my bedroom and looked around my bedroom and then they went inside my closet. There was a board game that had spilled all over the closet floor. It was at the back of the shelf at the top of my closet, so there was no way that it could have fallen without someone pushing it off. My parents helped me clean it up and put it back on the shelf. They said that there was nothing to be scared of and then they put me back to bed. They went back to bed too and a few minutes after they left, I heard someone whispering something. It sounded like they were calling my name. Then I saw a shadow that looked like a person walking across the wall by my closet. I thought it was a ghost and I started freaking out again and I grabbed my pillow and blanket and went to sleep on my parents' bedroom floor. After that, I slept on their floor for a few more nights. Eventually, I went back to sleeping in my bedroom and then I would lay in bed again at around midnight. I still heard footsteps in the attic and they continued every once in a while until we eventually moved away. To this day, I still don't know what or who that was, but it still freaks me out. It was around the summer of 2014 and I had just graduated out of college and my family needed to move to another city so our under construction home would soon be finished. We ended up getting two condo units. I stayed in the three bedroom unit with my grandma and then four year old cousin. Let's call her Anna. And Anna's parents stayed in the two bedroom unit since they worked the night shifts and didn't want to end up disrupting everyone's sleep when they got up to prepare for work. It was right in the middle of the first week that we had settled in that Anna suddenly got sick. My grandma brushed it off saying it had been from too much time in the cold pool. It was relatively quiet and Anna just slept it off for the first night that she was sick. The next morning was pretty uneventful. Anna and I were talking over breakfast and she was happily telling me a story when suddenly she stopped mid-sentence and just slouched and her eyes drooped and her mouth slightly open and the cereal just gushed out of her mouth. Knowing her, she wouldn't prank me like this because she's easily icked and wouldn't spill some chewed up cereal bits just for a prank and damn, she's also just four years old. I screamed for my grandma after what seemed like an eternity of just staring at her, not knowing what to do. I realized our grandma is not in the unit. She went up to the upper deck to do her laundry. I rushed out the door and ran up the stairs to the deck. We're on the fifth floor, by the way, and the deck was on the sixth floor. Panicking, I told her what happened and she panicked as well. 
We were hurrying out of the laundry area, and when we turned round the corner to go down the stairs, Anna was there, standing, as if not a four-year-old girl, and her head tilted to the side, and then she passed out. My grandma, being a believer of quack doctors over real doctors, called upon one of her friends, who is a sensitive and knows how to determine what attacked us and Anna. Mind you, Anna was asleep from this time around 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. when my grandma called the quack doctor. And just for the sake of the story, let's call her Isabel. Isabel took out a candle, lit it, and let the wax drip on a basin full of water. She then took out that wax floating around the water and interpreted from it that Anna was being attacked by a bad spirit of an old lady who has taken a liking to her. Anna suddenly awakened hysterically and kept on shouting, They're coming, they're coming. She was crying so much that I got so scared and I was already crying as well. Isabel was chanting prayers and everything was moving. The papers, curtains, lights were flickering on and off. After a while, Isabel finished her chanting and everything calmed down. Anna had calmed down and Isabel gave her a red pouch with something inside it. She said it's to ward off any bad spirit that may try to come near her and harm her. She gave me one too. And just like that, her fever was gone. We never told anyone about it, especially Anna's parents, although they had gone to the doctors the day after concerning her prior fever. Results were normal and nothing was wrong, and we never had a normal life after that day. It was a pretty uneventful day. We had just finished settling in our new home and out of the dreadful condo units that we occupied while this house was under construction. Everyone else had plans while I agreed to stay behind with my grandma to finish the decoration details around the house. When grandma's at home, you can expect a clean, fresh smelling home and she'll turn off all unnecessary lights around the house to conserve electricity. It was half past 11 in the morning when she called me down to eat. I was upstairs folding my clothes from our luggage. I went down and she was just taking the food out of the oven and told me, Oh good, I was just about to call you. It was weird because I solemnly swear I heard her just call me when I was upstairs. I dismissed it thinking that maybe she just forgot. We were eating and talking about our plans for the rest of the day. To give you a visual, our dining room table was rectangular with the less wide side facing the narrow staircase that would lead up to the bedrooms. That was when we heard it. A few thuds, what we guessed was from the upstairs landing, and then the sound progressed to what sounded like footsteps that were going down the stairs, and they became louder as it steps closer down the stairs to us. Then, after the last step on the stairs, it stopped. We both looked at each other with wide eyes, and we were both panting, and it was apparent that my grandma was scared too. She took a huge breath, and with trembling fingers, she flipped the switch to open all the downstairs lights and turned the TV on for some background noise. It was 11 in the freaking morning on a newly constructed house. We were so scared that we just ate in silence and then sat in the living room for what seemed like an eternity until everyone from our family came home. They asked us about our day and somehow we both knew in silent agreement that we should keep to ourselves what happened earlier. Later that night, around 9pm, everyone was in bed and as always, I share a room with my grandma and my aunt who was visiting us, she was in the same room as well. Everything was quiet and we had just the lamp on. My eyes were closed but I felt a shift in the mattress and the lamp light went out. I assumed it was my grandma that 
decided to conserve electricity again. I shrugged it off and I tried to fall asleep. I heard one of our family members went downstairs and was going on about the kitchen and I guess eating because we can hear the clatter of spoons and forks against the plate and the faucet turning on as well. Mind you, we don't have neighbors yet as the subdivision was still in early development. I fell fast asleep after that. In the morning, there was a slight commotion when I got to breakfast. Everyone was teasing my aunt, the one that slept next to me, saying that she got hungry again and went downstairs in the night, rummaging for some leftovers. My grandma was unaware of this as she brought my cousin, Anna, to school earlier this morning and hasn't been home yet. Everyone saw me walk down the stairs and when I caught up to their conversation, I blankly told them, no, Aunt Andy was beside me in bed the whole night. I thought it was one of you guys that went down. I was still just half asleep when I heard someone else eating too. Everyone got silent as I finished my sentence and from there, we all knew that it was never one of us who was making the noise that we heard last night. Ever since that event, we've had our own share of stories that made the chills run down all of our spines. And for some context, I've been friends with my friend, uh, let's call him Leo, since we were in diapers. Our families have known each other since they were in high school and therefore Leo and I grew close. Unfortunately, Leo's parents died when he was five and he had to move to Montana with his grandpa Tom. That's not his real name, but everyone at the reservation still calls him that. Ever since then, I try to visit him whenever I can and sometimes he comes to visit me. This year, I went to visit him and everything was chill for the first three days. We played video games, we went to town and generally just hung around. Now something that should be noted is that Grandpa Tom has always told us to never ever go into the forest near their house during the nighttime. Whenever we asked why, he would simply reply that it would be too dangerous to do so because we could get lost or attacked by an animal. Now, I knew that what Grandpa Tom said was probably true, but someone from town had told me that those woods were said to be haunted because years ago, a witch had sacrificed three people in the name of Satan and then committed suicide after the townspeople hung her son as an act of revenge. It's said that if you go far enough into the forest, you can find a giant pentagram on a stone altar and that if you get close enough, you could potentially be cursed. It was the fourth night and I was incredibly bored, so Leo and I decided to play truth or dare. It was all going well until he dared me to go into the woods with him. I decided to go because, after all, I really love exploring potentially haunted sites, and so together we snuck out of the house. The walk towards the forest was pretty normal until we went farther in, and then we sensed that someone was watching us. I also felt an immense sense of danger, anger, and evil. I grabbed Leo's arm and said, Leo, we've got to get out of here. It doesn't feel safe to go any further. He simply replied with, oh, are you scared? Something seemed off about Leo. His expression was blank. I usually don't scare easily because I've experienced paranormal stuff my whole life, but something was still off about my best friend. It was almost as if he was possessed. I let go of his arm and as I was about to pull out my phone to call Grandpa Tom for help, Leo grabbed my arm with such an immense force and looked me in the eyes and said, that won't work, no one can help you now. He then started laughing like a maniac and I struggled to get away from his tight grip. 
I was so scared and so I did what my mom always told me to do if someone tried to kidnap me. I kicked him in the nuts. That had seemed to startle him enough for him to loosen his grip and I was able to break free and run back towards Grandpa Tom's house. As I was running, I heard Leo yelling profanities and suddenly he started running behind me. He seemed to be running with an inhuman-like speed. In the blink of an eye, he appeared right in front of me, which seemed next to impossible. I was tired, but I was not about to let myself be killed in those wretched woods. I ran back towards where we had been when he attacked me, and as I looked back, he just stood there, smiling. Something was really off, but... I kept running until I came across an altar with a pentagram on it. I thought that this was the infamous altar where the witch had done her sacrifices. That place just radiated something extremely evil and I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to help my friend and I just wanted to go back to the safety of home. I was so tired that I fell on my knees and I started crying when all of a sudden I got an immense headache and this nauseating feeling. There was a lady walking towards me and she seemed nice and innocent but I knew better because she was emanating that same evil and there was the smell of rotting flesh. I knew that I had to get out of there but I seemed to be frozen in place. I did the only thing that I could think of which was to pray. Now I am an atheist but I didn't know what else to do. I prayed and prayed for everything to be okay. I opened my eyes to see that she was just standing there, looking at me while she held an unconscious Leo in her grip. I just looked right back at her and I prayed out loud. To this day, I don't know why, but I started praying in Latin and then in Italian. Now, I also know these languages, so it wasn't a speaking in tongues thing. And the more I prayed, the angrier she got. And the angrier she got, the louder I prayed. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out of nowhere. The witch turned around, startled, but I just resumed my praying. She turned to look back at me, and with the raspiest voice ever, she said, I just wanted more souls for my collection. I guess I'll have to claim other ones. Either way, your soul seems to belong to someone else. I got chills all over when she said that. She just dropped Leo and slowly disappeared into the night. I ran towards his unconscious body and I tried waking him up. He wouldn't wake up and I cried and I screamed his name, but it was no use. I thought he was dead. I cradled my best friend while I cried and sobbed. I thought I would die too because it was extremely cold. All my hope was lost when, by some miracle, I heard Grandpa Tom yelling our names. I yelled back and he ran towards us. The rest of the night went by like a breeze. Grandpa Tom took us to the hospital and Leo was thankfully fine. You all may not believe me, but I swear that I will never go back to those woods ever again. I've been debating about whether to post this or not, but I finally decided that it's been long enough for me to talk about it. This happened to me and my mom a few months ago, back in October. It happened in a very rural part of New Hampshire, like a side road on a side road type of neighborhood. It was pouring out as it had been raining for pretty much the whole day. My mom had just gotten back from down the street in my sister's car and I was on the couch in the living room when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. Our front door has a big glass pane in the front so we can look out from the inside and, well, someone can also look in from the outside. Through this window pane, I see a man. I didn't get a great look at him as I didn't have my long distance glasses on, 
The man noticed that I had seen him and waved as if trying to be friendly. For the rest of this post, I will refer to him as Poncho Man. I got up and thought about opening the door for Poncho Man, but I relented as I couldn't properly see who it was. I didn't want to let a stranger into the house. Instead, I went down the hall to my parents' bedroom where my mom was getting ready for work. She asked what was up and I explained to her that a man in a poncho was outside our door and wanted to talk to us. She went white as a ghost. Immediately, she stopped getting ready, closed and locked the bedroom door and started checking the windows to make sure they were locked too. I asked her what was going on. My mom explained that as she was driving home, she saw a poncho man. He had been standing motionless on the side of the main street. As soon as my mom turned down our road, he started to walk, presumably to follow her. She said the encounter was weird but thought nothing more of it. Why would someone be out in the pouring rain down a back road in the afternoon? It was like he was waiting for something. I started to panic as well. My mom called my aunt, they're like best friends, and asked what she should do. My aunt told her to call the police immediately and so we did. We proceeded to pace around the bedroom, frantically looking out of the windows to see if we could see Poncho Man. From where the bedroom was angled, it was impossible to look at the front porch and see if he was still there, but we were desperate for anything. After what felt like hours, we finally saw a police car pull up. We carefully unlocked the door and went down to let the officer in. We explained what we saw and he agreed to do a scan around the neighborhood. As he left, I noticed there was something on the doorknob. I took it off and it was a political ad for a candidate that was running for office. Now, it's possible that Poncho Man was just campaigning for the candidate, but there's a lot of holes in that story. It was pouring rain outside, so why would you go door to door? And why would you go that route in such a rural neighborhood? The houses are so far apart you'd barely make a dent on foot. The time doesn't make sense either. Sure, me and my mom were home, but it was about four in the afternoon. Most people would still be at work, so you'd probably get no response from knocking anyway. Eventually, the officer returned. He had found the guy down the road and said he had questioned him. Poncho Man was able to ID himself and he claimed that he was a political campaigner and was just knocking on doors for that exact reason. When probed further, conveniently enough, Poncho Man couldn't provide any other door signs as the one he had left on our house was the last one. That makes the campaign story even more absurd. Our house is in the middle of the street. It's not like we were the last by any means, so why wouldn't you bring enough for the whole street? Even the officer pointed this out to us and said that it was unusual behavior. Although the officer was suspicious of him, there wasn't anything he could really do about it, as there was no way to prove intent. He told us to be alert and to not hesitate to call if Poncho Man returns. Well, fast forward a few weeks and I start noticing that a police car seems to be permanently stationed down the road from us. It's about a three minute drive. I got curious and I asked my mom about it and she said that there were multiple break-ins into the houses down the road and the police were doing a sort of sting operation. The poncho man encounter and the break-ins may be unrelated, but considering how poncho man acted, I have a sinking feeling that they're actually connected. Thankfully, for the past few months, we've heard and seen nothing of Poncho Man. We got a new doorbell system with a camera, and the police left the area where they were doing the sting. I hope that this whole situation is over and done with, and that I never have to meet Poncho Man. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't have a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, 
Plus, the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So, the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order, and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike. He didn't have a profile picture or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh, wow, I guess I'm this person's first customer ever. But then, a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I think maybe something's glitching out, or maybe he's stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they ended up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver, and they're also on a bike, and they also don't have a profile picture, and they have no prior deliveries either. This driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I messaged them myself to say, hey, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but they never responded. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing issues, and there were none that I can find, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Same deal, they always tried to contact the driver with no response. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, and no prior deliveries. Only this time, his name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm just tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, I have your food. What's your phone number? And I respond right away with, ah, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded again with, what's your number? I'll be there in 10. How old are you? And at this point, the alarm bells are going off and I contact support immediately to have the order canceled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been canceled. I'll be refunded and started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the info she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking that this was just some creep or something, and that's when I hear a man's voice at the front door. Miss Metal Gear 42069, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and goes, Is that him? We canceled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open, but the metal screen door was closed and locked, but still allowed us to see each other. And I got a look at him. And when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to please leave because he's making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. And at this point, he starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay and the man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and I hurriedly closed the heavy door and I locked it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up the sidewalk and for a moment I thought he shoved off so I finished my conversation with the uber safety woman so she could submit the report. 
And once she submitted it, I called the police and I told them what happened. Now, they weren't incredibly helpful at first since he didn't actually break in or put his hands on me. And they told me that if he came back to call again and they would send an officer out. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report plus a description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man that I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat and I guess they just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So, basically, this was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this because, honestly... I'm still pretty shaken up and I'll be avoiding these delivery apps for quite a while. So, to the strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for my personal information and then proceeded to try and break in, let's not meet. It's the mid-1990s on a rural road in South Mississippi. It was springtime just a few months before we were supposed to graduate high school and leave everything we knew behind. My best friend's dad owned a used car dealership. The previous week, we had gotten a small, sporty Mazda convertible. His dad liked to give his new cars a week or so of running around to make sure he wasn't selling any lemons, so he gave us the keys and sent us off to give it a test drive around the rural back roads of the pine belt with heartfelt promises from both of us that we would be safe and definitely not speed or drive irresponsibly. A promise we kept to the next intersection before zooming out of sight. We had been driving around for about an hour before coming back to this one section of two-lane highway that ran through a floodplain for a small muddy water creek. The road was on an embankment so it wouldn't flood every time it rained, so there was a steep 15-foot high drop-off on either side of the road. I mean, there's no pulling over to the side of the road if you were to break down on this section of roadway. The stretch that we were on was straight but had a small hill that crested at about the halfway mark of this half mile or so of asphalt. We had been enjoying our freedom and broken promises to his dad, and this particular moment was no different. We quickly ran up to a car that was very likely going the speed limit, but they were driving way too slow for us and that little Mazda. My friend and I looked at each other with a grin. He downshifted and gave it plenty of gas, eager to leave the slower car in our dust. As we crested the hill, a blur of metal appeared in our lane, barreling towards us at an alarming speed. We weren't even a hundred feet from the other car coming straight at us. I distinctly remember the driver in that car bracing himself, his eyes wide, knowing his options for avoiding a collision were zero to none. My best friend and I both yelled, oh shit, in unison as I squeezed my eyes shut bracing for the inevitable collision. There's no way that we could have missed that car. I saw the driver's eyes. He was so close. Impact was inevitable. Except the sickening explosion of metal crunching against metal at high speed never came. I opened my eyes and I looked to my left. I saw my friend's arm nonchalantly resting on the door his mouth open as he sang along to the gin blossoms follow you down. It was a beautiful day. The roof was down, the radio was blaring, and there wasn't a car in sight. Not even the one that we attempted to pass. I blinked a few times. I looked again to make sure that I was believing what I was seeing. Not wanting to hear my friend gloat about how awesome of a driver he is, 
I didn't ask him how he avoided the other car. He didn't even seem phased by it. I'm a skeptical man, but that incident was one of two things in my life that I simply cannot explain. In our 30s, when we happened to find ourselves in the same town one evening, we met up for beers, and between asking about our careers and our families, I brought up the incident. I said, do you remember that time that your dad gave us the Mazda to drive around and how we almost hit that car? He thought about it for a second and I saw the blood drain from his face. Holy shit, he said, I do remember that. What happened? I told him I didn't know, but I had hoped that he would have filled in the blanks for me. I felt an ice cold chill race up my spine. This past year, he brought his family to my town for a vacation. They came to my house for dinner and I wanted to tell our wives the story and have him tell his side of it all. This time, my friend seemed to have no recollection of it, as if his mind had completely erased the experience. Even when I reminded him of our previous conversations about it, he looked at me with a blank stare, as if he had never heard the story before. And so, the mystery of that near accident on the back roads of Mississippi remains unsolved, a strange and inexplicable memory that haunts me to this day, a mystery that seems to get stranger and stranger as the years go on. I have a young cat who's really smart and really naughty. She's allowed outside during the day, but she's also afraid of birds, <laughs> so she prefers it if me or my partner are outside with her. However, she really wants to be out at night, like very badly, and she knows she's not allowed. She used to try to bolt if the door was open, even for a second, but we wised up to her and now she tries to be stealthy. It doesn't work on me because I've got her number, but my partner can be oblivious sometimes and she'll take the opportunity to slip out. I like to read, smoke, and drink on the back deck at night and there's a huge glass paneled door that she can jealously watch me through. Sometimes she stays by the door the entire time, especially when the moths are out, but sometimes she gets bored and goes to her spot on the couch. Well. One night, I'm out reading and drinking and I hear a soft thump on the deck. I look up and there she is, that little rat. I start scolding her for being out at night, assuming my partner accidentally let her out, and she ignores me, doing her usual routine of standing up on her haunches and smelling this particular spot on the wall. It's an unusual posture and it looks really funny and distinct. As I'm still scolding her, she meanders under the table just out of my reach. I look under, but she seems to have disappeared into the shadows. I know she'll eventually want to come back in, so I don't pursue her. I mean, that just makes her stay out anyway. So I get up and I go in to refill my drink and to yell at my partner. And what do I see? She's in her spot on the couch, completely passed out asleep. I start yelling for my partner and she wakes up, slightly looking at me through drowsy eyes. I saw her outside less than two minutes ago and my partner said that they hadn't gone out at all recently. I started to wonder if there was a cat who just looked like her, but she's so distinct, down to her extra hangy primordial pouch and silly little quirks and clearly the cat outside knew me and was comfortable with me. We also don't have many strays around here because we border the wilderness and they can't survive. I know all of my neighbor's cats and they definitely don't look or act like mine. Here's the TLDR. I saw my cat outside, but when I went inside, she was sleeping on the couch. Was she astral projecting? Was I seeing into the future or the past? Or does my cat have a doppelganger? That's a duplicate. There's a place in Nova Scotia known locally as Little Girl's Grave. 
It's a gravestone of a young girl named Catherine McIntosh. She died of an illness and was originally buried in McLennan Cemetery. However, due to a dispute with a neighbor, her body was dug up and moved to the side of Greenvale Road in front of the family farm. One night, I went with two friends to visit the gravestone. It was a dark and foggy night. Driving down the eerie, winding dirt road until we came upon the location, we brought a toy to leave at the gravestone. The local lore surrounding the site says to leave a toy for her and to never take a toy away. It wasn't until we left and began driving down the dirt road that we had a paranormal experience. We noticed on the front windshield in the condensation a small child's footprint on the glass. It was so detailed and human-like. It scared us quite a bit, to say the least. One of the friends that I had visited the gravesite with, we worked at the same restaurant at the time. Well, a few days after we had visited the site, we were working together and we both heard something truly bizarre. It was the sound of a child laughing, very faintly. We both stared at each other in disbelief and we had no idea where the sound was coming from whatsoever as there was no one around except just the two of us. Not long after this, we had a falling out and we haven't spoken to each other since 2013. This is one of the only paranormal experiences that I've encountered in my life. If anyone who listens to this has had any similar experiences at this gravestone, please share. Thank you for listening to my story and may you all have a good evening. When I was a child, I had two separate experiences that may have been supernatural or may have simply been my mind playing tricks on me. However, when I was about 18 or 19, I experienced something that was definitely supernatural. On the southern tip of Staten Island, there lies the Conference House and its surrounding park. Up until the early 2000s, there was about a half a dozen houses on parks department grounds that were vacated and demolished so that they could make walking trails and such. An ex-girlfriend of mine has lived in one of these houses with her mother and her sisters. When I would spend the night, I would share the pullout bed with her in the living room. However, there was one night where it was particularly hot, so we went upstairs and slept in her sister's bedroom since it was cooler in there and they wouldn't be home that night. For whatever reason, I couldn't sleep comfortably at all. I would wake up and just look out towards the window across the room. At around the third time I woke up, I saw something standing between the bed and the window, nearer to the window. I was told this house was haunted and in the year and a half since I started hanging out there with my ex and her sisters, I had never really seen anything. So this one night, I see standing near a window a silhouette of a human figure. It was just standing there. Even though the room was dark, there was still enough moonlight illuminating the room, yet what I saw was pitch black. I'm talking blacker than the blackest black times infinity. I wasn't able to make out any facial distinctions. It was like it was devoid of anything human. It really was just a black silhouette and it was terrifying. After staring at this entity for what seemed like forever or just three seconds, I woke up my then girlfriend. I asked if she was seeing what I was seeing and she did. I quickly asked what we should do and she said we should go downstairs to which all I could say was okay. Luckily, the door to the hallway was about two feet away from the bed on her side. After she got up, I quickly followed. Instead of getting up on my side, which would have placed me between the foot of the bed and the entity, I rolled across the bed and hurried my way out, never looking back. That was the one and only time I ever experienced anything in that house, but that moment has stayed with me for nearly 20 years. 
Even though those houses were demolished in the early 2000s, I don't dare walk down that block at night. I was homeless in Long Beach, California in 1980 at 16 years old because my mom was in federal prison and my dad lived in Texas. I was staying in cars and garages. I was hitchhiking from downtown to Belmont Shores one day and was given a ride by a dude who was kind of strange, but I wasn't worried. I was already a hard drug user and I had been arrested for 25 pounds of marijuana in Huntington Beach, but that's another story. I was picked up by this dude and as we drove down Ocean Boulevard, he said to me, I have to make a short detour and pick up some Valiums. I said okay and we turned onto Coronado Street and drove a few blocks up the street. He parked in front of a small apartment building and said, I'll be right back. I was waiting in the car and he came from the apartment to the car. He said his cousin had locked the Valiums in a safe and he had paged him and was waiting for him to call him with the combo. He asked if I wanted to come up and smoke. I was like, okay, because I was a pothead. I followed him upstairs and entered the apartment. I sat down on the couch and immediately scanned the room for weapons because he was kind of strange. I mean, Long Beach is full of kind of strange people anyway. I saw a pair of scissors and some other stuff scattered around the apartment. It was fairly clean and well kept. As I'm looking around, he reaches under the couch for what I thought was a weed tray. He says, hey, you ever seen one of these? And as I look at what's in his hands, it's a pair of flex cuffs and he says, try them on and then he attacks me. He grabs my wrists and pulls out a can of mace and sprays me right in the face. He's able to get the zip tie around my wrists, but I pulled one hand out as he tightened it. I jumped up as we were fighting and I got to the scissors. I grabbed the scissors and he got me in a bear hug from behind. I stabbed him in the face as he was trying to pin my arms. I'm fighting for my life and I stabbed as hard as I could. His grip moved up and pinned my arms and began choking me from behind. I wasn't able to breathe and I thought I was going to die. So I went limp and acted like I was done. He dropped me to the floor and dragged me to the bathroom by my arm. He opened the bathroom door and turned on the sink water and said, wash your face and left me standing there. I immediately jumped onto the rim of the bathtub and he stuck his arm in the door holding a towel. I was going to jump out of the second story window. When I saw his arm sticking through the door, my body blocked the door and he fell back and I jumped over him and we ran to the front door. I got to the front door and to my horror, I saw that it was a key lock on the inside. I grabbed the doorknob and turned and it opened. I ran outside and began beating on every upstairs door of that building. It was like 12 units, so I ran and I yelled, Police! Police! Call the police! I ran downstairs and there were two guys tossing a football in the street. They must have tripped out because I was freaking out and I had a zip tie around my wrist. They asked me what was going on and I told them what happened. Now. So I was explaining what happened and they cut the zip tie off and the weirdo tried to come out and leave. The guys that were now helping me told the dude that the cops are on the way and that you ain't going nowhere. I heard the sirens and three police cars came with lights and sirens blazing. The police asked me what happened and I explained what happened. They went up to his apartment and came down and told me I had to go up to the apartment, but I didn't want to go back in there. He told the police I tried to rob him and stabbed him in the face. He said he wasn't gay and the police looked around and found some gay stuff and they had the zip tie that was cut off my wrists. They took me outside and explained because I was a juvenile that my parents would also have to come to the station to press charges. They told me that if they arrested him, I would be coming also. I said I refused to press charges because I didn't want my parents involved. 
and they left, and I went on my merry way. My mom got out of the feds, and I moved to Texas for five years. I came back, and my mom and sister had bought a house almost directly across the street from the apartment where this happened. My sister said she wanted to introduce me to her new husband, and I almost had a heart attack. It was the dude tossing the football that day, and he said, where do I know you from? I was like, hey, you remember the kid with the zip tie, right? And he's like, no freaking way, man. It's crazy. This happened when I was in high school. It was a long time ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. And I don't remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than how I remembered it. There was a 17-year-old female working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime. A man comes in. He's short, overweight. He's balding. He's in his 40s. Generally creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet. I mean, obviously it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing as he came into a flower shop. Then, he goes into detail about how he hit her and asks me if I think he was right to do so. This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks when I get off of work. I dodge the question and he eventually leaves. Then nothing for six months. And then right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark, and from the outside it looked like I was working alone because my coworker, who was about a 40-year-old female at the time, was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something just isn't right, and, well, everything felt not right. I then notice that he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious that he wanted it to be seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my coworker and said, he has a gun, and I handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the police. I shook my head no as I felt like it would just escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and then took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends maybe 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop in retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for a pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and info for the police report that I am sure as hell about to file. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's card, and he replies, no, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves, and we quickly lock the door and watch him just sit in his truck outside. We were not going to exit the shop until he was finally gone. Eventually, he pulls out of his parking spot and then moves to another spot further away and just continues to sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom, crying, and she called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what had happened, and she told her mom. 
Her mom happened to work with the man and informed security at their job. She said he was very weird, very creepy, and that he liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to deal with tech and security, well, they pulled him into their office and they questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver, and the police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit that job, which was devastating because I loved it there. But in retrospect, it was totally the right call. The dude came in on Valentine's Day and picked up his order. I never saw him again. Me and my best friend in college went from Alabama to Atlanta, Georgia, um, a bunch of times just to shop, go to Six Flags, eat, whatever, but one time we were coming back super late, like after midnight, and once you're past noon in Georgia on I-85 going towards Alabama, there's a good stretch of nothing, but we got hungry and got off because the interstate sign said there was a Wendy's. We turned left, as the sign said, and went across the bridge and didn't see a Wendy's, but we kept driving. We were nearly 20 minutes down the road, talking, and realized there was no restaurant. The road we were on bent to the right, and was a T-intersection stop sign. There was another interstate sign saying I-85 to the right. We said, huh, okay and turned right and thought that we would just go back to the interstate and go up to another exit to find food. After five minutes down the road, though, there was an empty gas station and the Wendy's. It was open. We thought, okay, well, that was a ways to get there from the interstate 25 minutes ago, but whatever. We also needed gas, so we got gas first. Another vehicle pulls up at the pump across from us and the old guy gets out. He freezes and stares silently like a horror movie at me pumping gas. He left before me which seemed quick and my soul shivered but I finished and we went into the Wendy's drive through The server at the speaker and window sounded like a tired robot and also stared at us blankly like a zombie without blinking. We waited and got our food and couldn't wait to leave. Just before driving off, I look at the gas station again and the same creepy man is there, in the same spot, staring at us in the Wendy's line completely silent and still. We turned right quickly on that same road, going the same direction towards where it said the interstate would be. We seemed to drive longer than we thought without the interstate popping up and, well, we decided just to turn around and retrace our drive. We went back the opposite direction looking for the Wendy so that we knew about how far the left turn would be, but before you know it, there was the left turn with no gas station and no Wendy's. We turned left anyway and went back to the interstate just like we came and we ate our ghost Wendy's in silence halfway home before having the gumption to ask each other if that really just happened. <laughs>